All right, keep a place here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And turn back, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. So we're going to continue on. Uh, I think most of you are here for the sermon this morning. And I'm starting a series here going through the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And we're going to look and kind of take a deep dive into each of the churches that are listed in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we're going to look at their strengths and we're going to look at their weaknesses. We're going to look at the things that God said they needed to strengthen and to repent or else he's going to take away their candlestick. We're also going to look at the areas where God is commending them for doing what's right and doing what's good so that we can have a good idea of what God expects out of a church. We want to be able to look at the Bible and say, okay, well, if he's commending all these things about these churches, well, then, you know, maybe we should have the same things incorporated in our church and kind of be doing, following that same pattern of the good things, as well as then avoiding the pitfalls of where God's saying, hey, if you don't do this, you know, I'm going to remove your candlestick. You know, God forbid, we saw this morning with Ephesus, they were doing all kinds of great things. They're doing lots of work and labor and all this other stuff, but they had lost their love of the first works. They lost that first love which I preach this morning is going out soul winning and preaching the gospel to people and getting people saved and converting people to Christ. That is, you know, God forbid our church would ever get to that point where we cease to be a soul winning church. It's extremely important. I mean, he starts off with that letter to Ephesus and um, makes that like, if you don't have that, then God will remove your candlestick. But that was this morning sermon. This evening is actually a really interesting one because we're going to be going through the, you know, the church of Smyrna. And the, the interesting about the thing about the church of Smyrna is that they don't have any negative uh, things brought up to the letter of this church. So all the other churches, God's saying, you know, hey, repent or else, you know, I'm going to come quickly or else I'm going to come and I remove your candlestick. Smyrna is an example of a church that's got everything down enough to be to God not to be criticizing them for anything. But what's also interesting, what you're going to see is that what, what, what does the church get? So the church that has nothing that they're being warned about that they're specifically doing wrong, they still receive a warning. We're going to read that. And that warning is that tribulation is coming. So you watch out because you're doing everything right. That's when the persecution hits. That's when the tribulation starts. That's when you're going to go through problems. It's really interesting that of all the churches, the one who has nothing wrong is the one getting the most warnings about bad times to come. You see, when, when you're doing things right as a believer, as a Christian, or as a church, you can't expect it to be a cakewalk. You can't expect just, oh man, I'm so blessed and everything. Now look, you can have joy in serving the Lord, but you can't expect everything just to be easy. Because the Christian life, when you're doing everything right, is not the easy way. It's not the easy path. It's not the easy way out. You don't just float through life. It's a lot of hard work and labor, and you're going to be suffering persecution. You're going to go through hard times, and you're going to, it's not just going to be easy and handed to you on a silver platter. That's not the way that Jesus works. That's not, that's not how it was for him. When people decided to follow him, what did Jesus say? When he said, hey, master, I'll follow you whithersoever thou goest. He says, the birds of the air have nests. The foxes have dens, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. It wasn't easy. The work that he was doing wasn't easy. He didn't even know where he was going to sleep from night to night half the time. He's going around. He's traveling around. He's preaching the gospel. He's healing people. He's also facing people conspiring to murder him. He's also facing a lot of opposition. He's running across devils in his work and, you know, and casting out demons. He's doing all of this stuff. It's not an easy path. But that is the path of righteousness in the right way. So you can't expect, and especially when things are going wrong, man, there's all this turmoil and drama and trouble and everything else, you're probably, it's probably a good sign you're doing something right as opposed to something wrong. People, unfortunately, want to be comfortable. It's in our human nature to want to be comfortable. Look, I don't look forward to, you know, fights and everything else as in like, like that's not something that brings me joy is to be in a fight. But at the same time, I understand that there is going to be a lot of fights. I understand that there's going to be tribulation. I understand there's going to be persecution and that I can't expect this life to just offer me um, a cakewalk of an existence because we're working towards something. We're working to enter into that rest. 
that we will get one day in the kingdom. But for now, we're at work. For now, we're at war. For now, there's all these other symbolic references that the Bible gives us to explain what we're doing here and that it, it's and not to expect it to be easy. Let's read what the Bible says and what's written unto the angel of the church of Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible reads, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things said the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And notice, like I said before, I know thy works. That's how he starts off addressing every single church. I know thy works. I know what you're doing. And tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. This is what he's, you know, the report. This is the letter that's going to the church in Smyrna. And I think once Smyrna reads all the other reports that were sent to all the other churches, they got to be thinking, hey, we got it good. Now, none of the other churches are really being warned about this level of persecution. And man, Satan, you know, like, you've got, you've got, um, the devil going to be casting you into prison and things like that. But they're getting this going like, oh, this isn't, this isn't that great of a letter. But then on the contrary wise, God's also not, not you know, criticizing them for having major problems either. So this is where you want to be. You want to be in the church of Smyrna because God's not criticizing what they're doing. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And as a result, Satan's attacking so we're going to spend a little bit of time now starting off again in verse number nine. He starts off going to, I know thy works and tribulation. So I was getting a little bit ahead of myself here when I opened up the sermon because unfortunately Christians at large, the, the overwhelming consensus I would say among Christianity, quote unquote, is that people have this not just a desire, but belief that like you can live the Christian life and you should have all your ducks in a row and everything should be fine and you should kind of be living this perfect life and there's no drama, no turmoil and everything should just be just structured and this is the way it is and, and everything goes well and you live your life and you work and you do these other things and, and everything is just totally peaceful all the time. That is not the biblical Christian life. That's not, a, that does, that's not the picture that the Bible paints that you are going to face when you're doing well. And I hate to break it to you, but it's not. And I know it's, it, it sounds great to just have everything cared for and everything done and not a care in the world and, and just be able to get by and just kind of enjoy everything and not really do anything and not work hard. That may sound good, but that's not the way that the actual Christian life is when you're being a disciple, when you're following Christ. And of course, I've got some scripture to back this up. And we're going to look at some passages where the Bible talks about tribulation. You could go ahead and, and turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 because we're going to go back to that. But I'll read for you from John 16. John 16, verse 33, famous words of Jesus Christ said, These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So the tribulation that we receive in this world, it's not that we can't still have a sense of peace. It's not that uh, we can't have peace in our hearts or in our life, but we have to get that peace through Jesus Christ and the understanding and the knowledge that we will face tribulation, we will face hard times, we will face persecutions, but... Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus is the victor. We know that in the end, that if we patiently endure, we get through and we're going to come through as gold. And that trial isn't going to be pleasant, but the peace is in the hope and understanding of the end of the matter, not the beginning or not the middle. It's the end that we're looking to. It's the new heaven and new earth. It's the new Jerusalem. It's the millennial reign of Christ. Those are the things that we are looking to. It's the judgment seat of Christ, right? When you're going through the hard times, 
we're looking at we can have peace going through persecution by going, hey, whatever they're doing to me, whatever people are, are falsely accusing me of and railing on me about and, and, you know, whatever I'm suffering for Christ, God will reward me for those things. That should offer a level of peace and comfort just knowing that, okay, well, this isn't pleasant right now I'm going through. It may be difficult. It may be hard. I can have the peace and comfort of knowing what's to come. And that's why Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So no matter how hard the world fights against you, we know that our faith is in the one that overcame the world. And if he overcame the world, you know, what is the victory? It's our faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Acts chapter 14, verse number 21, the Bible reads, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. So they preach the gospel, right? Here's what's going on, Acts 14. They preach the gospel, they taught many, and they go back to these other places where they had been preaching the gospel, getting people saved, getting people grounded and established in their faith, confirming the souls, Right, just, just following back up with them, making sure they're still going strong, they're still doing what they're supposed to be doing, they're still serving the Lord, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, encouraging them, hey, just keep going stronger, you know, giving them what they need to get through. And it says this, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So they're encouraging them, they're checking up on them, making sure everything's good, and saying, you know what? We need, you know, as a Christian, you're going to be going through a lot of tribulation. That's how we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. It's, it's through much tribulation, through much trial. This is what they could expect, and we shouldn't expect any different if we're going to be living godly and righteously. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, where we started reading, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So again, we're seeing this comforting and establishing of these other believers, like I already read in Acts chapter 14. And then in verse 3, it says that no man should be moved by these afflictions. He's saying, we sent him we sent Timotheus to comfort you and establish you and strengthen you and make sure that the afflictions, the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions to come are not going to shake your faith. They're not going to uh, upend you. It says that no man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Reminding them, you know that we are appointed to afflictions. And this is funny about, you know, when people believe in the, in the, the pre-tribulational rapture, they always like to point to, well, we're not appointed unto wrath. And they're right, we're not appointed unto wrath, but we are appointed unto tribulation. And this verse right here says, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. And he's talking about afflictions. He's talking about persecutions. He's talking about tribulations. Jesus said that in John 16, that we're going to suffer tribulation. Uh, you know, all throughout the scripture, basically, especially in the New Testament, you see, the, you see tribulations and trials and troubles experienced by everybody who's a disciple of Jesus Christ. We see that throughout the whole Bible, the prophets. The prophets didn't have it easy. They always had people fighting against them. They had rulers fighting against them. They had wicked kings and wicked rulers trying to kill them and, and had it out for them. We see that Every time you've got people serving the Lord, they were facing their own struggles and own trials. And we can't think, regardless of, of what land we live in and how much freedom we have and, and how much blessings we have and securities and, and every other thing's going on, we still can't expect not to have tribulation if we're truly going to be following Jesus Christ because it will come, because there are people that hate God that will bring it to you. You don't have to go out and seek it. None of these people that we're reading about were going out seeking trouble. What they were doing was doing the work of the Lord and trouble found them. 
I mean, how many times do you see in the book of Acts, the Jews are following the disciples into different cities and stirring up the people against them? The, the Christ-rejecting Jews that hated God are going and causing problems for the people who are just trying to convert people to Christ. They're just going out soul winning. They're going out trying to teach people and lead people and guide people. But these children of the devil are going out and causing the problems for them. And the more work that you're doing and the more work that our church does and, and is, is going to mean more tribulation to come. Now, thankfully, I don't think we've, we've had very much. I mean, we've had a little bit here and there, but overall it hasn't been too bad. But guess what? We're just getting started. And if we could continue to go strong, we need to expect this to happen. Turn, if you would, to um, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Of course, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's a promise in, in God's word. All that will live godly. You want to live godly. You're trying to live godly. In Christ Jesus, it says, all shall suffer persecution. Don't believe in this prosperity gospel nonsense that teaches that, oh, the more blessed you have and the more money you have, you know, the, that just shows how much, how much more right with God you are or whatever. These false, phony, false prophets that are out there teaching their prosperity, health, and wealth gospels is a bunch of garbage because all throughout Scripture we see the exact opposite. We see people being persecuted and going through hard times that are actually serving the Lord. Matthew chapter 13, look at verse number 20. This is the parable of the sower. And um, this is the seed in the stony places. Verse 20, the Bible says, But he that received the seed in the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. So this person gets saved. They receive the word of God. They believe. They, 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 they receive it, and there's new life brought forth. It says, Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So this person doesn't have the strength and isn't set, you know, grounded enough in their faith to be able to get through the persecution that comes when their faith is tried. And that's why it says they, dureth, they, they endure basically for a while, but then they get offended and they kind of get out of it and, and stop serving the Lord and stop doing anything for the Lord when the tribulation or persecution arises. And the Bible's talking about this arises because of the word because of the word of God, because that they've received that and hold that to be true. And when people decide, hey, this is true, I accept this, I'm putting my faith in this, and start believing the, the, the Bible and, and start off doing right and you want to do right, you can expect to face the tribulation and trials to come. And we don't want to be those that are going to be like on the stony ground and only endure for a while, we want to make it through those persecutions. And part of, of that is just by knowing that it's going to happen. Flip back, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. So it's well established in Scripture that believers can expect to go through tribulation. We can have peace because Christ has overcome the world. But just know that while we're here, you can't, you know, if you're expecting everything just to be perfect in your life and not to have any problems or anybody hate you or anyone attack you or anything like that, then you're going to have a rude, rude awakening when you actually are serving the Lord and you have that tribulation or persecution come your way. Revelation 2 also mentioned, he said, I know that works in tribulation and poverty. He says, but thou art rich. So another aspect that we see about this church in Smyrna is that this wasn't some fancy pants rich church, you know, where everyone, you know, in this nice part of town and they had all the, the fancy stuff. But you know what I still love about this church? Jesus didn't have anything to condemn them about. They didn't need to have all the money. They could live in poverty yet still be rich in God's eyes. Who cares what the world has to offer and the riches of this world and how much wealth and money and, and gold you can accumulate up on this earth because it's not going to go with you. It means nothing. It's less than nothing. And it's not that you have to 
try to like if you have any money to like get rid of it and just become po like poor on purpose and not have any money but what the bible is saying here that is that we need to be rich towards god so whether you have physical goods or not you need to make sure that you're rich towards god and that you're seeking the treasures that are in heaven and not the treasures on earth and matthew 6 covers this perfectly look at verse number 19 in Matthew chapter 6, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We look at the, the church in Smyrna as a church that whose heart is in heaven, whose heart is minding the things of God and yeah, they may be in poverty physically on this earth, but who cares? Who cares if people look down on you and say, oh, you don't have enough money for this or that? Who cares? That doesn't matter. That's what the world thinks. The world wants to focus everything on how much money you have and how many toys you have and all this other stuff, but that's not what God looks at. And the Bible's teaching us here, why are you laying up these treasures for yourself? I mean, the rust is just going to consume it. Russ is going to consume that car and that boat. It's just a matter of time. It's all going to go to trash anyways. Thieves can come in and steal it. And then what are you going to do? You worked all, that, you worked all those hours and all that time to, to lay up all these treasures and they're just gone overnight. They could be gone like that. But there's treasures that nobody can steal. There's treasures that don't fade away that are worth your time investment. And this is what the Bible is teaching that we need to be focused on. And, you know, God may be aware of your poverty because he's also promised to clothe and feed you, as we're going to see here in Matthew chapter 6. He promises to take care of us. He's like, I know your poverty. That's fine. He says, but you're really rich. That's what he told the church at Smyrna. But thou art rich. This is the mindset that we need to have here to be a good church that God's not going to, you know, give anything about is to have works to, to, you know, if we're suffering tribulation, it means we're on the right track. And he says here in the poverty, and like I said, I'm not saying you have to just, just get rid of any goods that you have, but that's not the focus and it's not where our heart should be. Verse number 22 in Matthew 6, the Bible says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, Thy whole body shall be full of light, but if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And that's what it boils down to is that, look, you're going to choose you this day who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve money or are you going to serve God? Because you can't serve both. You serve money and you can lay up all these treasures and do all this stuff in this world and just basically have a vain life that ultimately isn't going to mean a hill of beans or you can spend your time serving God. You cannot serve them both because you only have, everyone only has so much time in a day. So you're going to have to choose who you're going to serve. Verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now, he's talking about here, he's talking about food and raiment, food and clothing, and he's saying not to even be concerned with that. This is interesting to me because we do live in such a rich culture and rich society and just the, the land has been blessed so much that anybody in here, even the poorest of people in this room, is not really that struggling and hard-pressed for food and clothing. 
Yet this is what he's saying. You don't even have to worry about that. Most people in America are worried about a lot more things than even just basic needs. I mean, food and clothing are basic needs. If you're going to be concerned about anything physical in this life, to me, that makes the most sense of like, well, man, you know, we, <laughs> I need to be dressed and I need to have food in my belly. Like to me, those are the most basic essential things that would make the most sense to be concerned about. And he's teaching that we don't even need to be concerned about that. If this is the level he's talking about, what, then what about the other stuff that people get so caught up and concerned with that we end up serving? It's so far beyond the, the food and the clothing. It's like, where are our priorities at? And, and you know, this is, you, you can't get past what the Bible is teaching here where he's basically saying, you know, even Solomon. Solomon had all these riches. God blessed him not only with the wisdom, but then he also blessed him to have basically more riches than anyone that was before him. And just uh, that he was just, extremely blessed with wisdom and with physical goods and he's saying even the man who had who could get anything he wanted just in this whole earth and have people work for him and have people you know tailor his clothes and make him out of whatever he wanted a made out of just because he had access to anything he wanted and just had all the wealth to be able to do it even solomon wasn't arrayed how god dresses the grass right he's saying look at the lilies look at the field Look at these beautiful flowers out there. That's way, that's so much better than anything man can produce and God's taking care of the grass. He's like, God doesn't even care about the grass like he cares about you. So why are you worried? If he's, if he's gonna clothe the grass, which today is and tomorrow, it just dries up and it's gonna be burned in the fire. Why do you care so much about what you're wearing? So he's saying, God will take care of that. God, look how well God takes care of the grass. You think he won't take care of you? Verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And again, I can't stress this enough that we have a unique perspective in the, the, the day and age that we live in because it is literally probably the richest age in history as far as access to things and, and food and you know, just, just kind of everything, all this wealth that exists in the United States of America is is unprecedented in history because most people the common person throughout history did not have very much i mean you're reading the bible they had you know maybe one one outfit right their clothing their whole wardrobe consisted of like one thing or two things and and you know getting food on a you know just just everything all of the stuff that we have access to today is so much different don't allow this to get to your head. I mean, let's, let's, let's really take this in and internalize this of, he's talking about just the most basic things. If you stripped everything else away that you have and that you focus your time and energy on, you know, how much more important is the food and clothing than the other things that we focus on? The computers and the cell phones and the gadgets and this and that. It's like people live for this stuff when throughout history, people were really concerned just about eating and being, and being clothed. And God is saying, don't even worry about that. Because he'll take care of you. Set your mind and your heart and treasure on serving the Lord. Get your heart right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He'll take care of you. We need to, to get back to having that mindset. See, the people in Smyrna weren't concerned about their poverty physically. Their physical poverty didn't mean anything. They still served the Lord. They still were doing what's right. They still faced the tribulations and persecutions. And even in light of people, you know, throwing them into prison and throwing them into jail, God still said, you know what, but you're really rich. Because they took heed to what Matthew 6 was teaching. 
They laid up for themselves treasures in heaven. And you know what? I want to do the same thing. And I want you to do the same thing. I want you to be rich in heaven. So we need to, to get the right mindset to drive us to earn these eternal rewards. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now because, again, we're, we're kind of hitting these various topics that are brought up about this church in Smyrna. So after he says, I know that works, tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich, he makes this statement, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So obviously there was something else going on here with this church as well, which I believe is where the persecution was coming from. Because in the next sentence he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. So the synagogue of Satan is doing the devil's work, right? And, and persecuting and getting them cast into prison. But who are these people? Who are these, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not? I, I think this is actually really simple to see who this is talking about. But turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 2 real quick. We're going to go over some, some scripture about this. These days, you could probably have a, fit a lot of people in this category, people who say they're Jews and are not. You got the, what is it, the, the black Hebrew Israelites, right? Those people that say that they're Jews, they're not. They teach a total works-based salvation. Okay, they're not Jews. And notice, okay, what I, the reason, how I refuted that is that they have a works-based salvation. I don't care what the color of their skin is. That doesn't matter. I'm not going to refute whether or not someone's a Jew based on what they look like and what their heritage is. Nor am I going to determine if someone's really a Jew based on are they the seed of Abraham. Because that's what the people did who, the people that I believe this Bible, this verse is actually talking about, the people who say they're Jews and are not, that's what they do. They get caught up in the genealogy. They look to see, oh no, I'm a physical seed of Abraham. And anybody who has that mindset falls into this category. The black Hebrew Israelites fall into that category. They're going to go back and tell you why, no, no, really, we're the, you know, you're doing, they're doing the same exact thing that the Jews of Jesus' day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees did. The same thing. And they believe the same stuff, too. I mean, maybe not exactly, but, you know, still works-based, law-based religion. Romans 2, though, this is, this is, this is key. Romans 2.28 the Bible explains in Romans 2.28, and, you know, Romans in general, it talks a lot about, you know, there's no difference, the Jew and the Greek or the Jew and the Gentile, right? That is to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and, and, and it goes back and forth on this. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, you know, you, you go through Romans and you're going to see that over and over again. But uh, verse number 28, chapter 2, the Bible says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. See, God looks at things through his own lens and, and basically using the truth, right? When God looks at churches, there are some churches he looks at that aren't even legitimate churches. They don't have a candlestick. So when God sees a group of people, he's like, that's not even a church. It doesn't matter if they have church in the name. It doesn't matter if church is posted on a big placard outside of the building. It doesn't matter if everybody inside of that building that congregates together thinks, hey, we're a church of God. God recognizes. None of that matters because when God looks at them, he doesn't see a church. In like manner, it doesn't matter if someone says, well, I'm a Jew. And I can trace back my genealogy. And I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. And, I, you know, and this is my ancestry. No, I'm a seed of Abraham because the Bible says that he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, which would be your flesh, which would be your descendancy. That is not what makes you a Jew. He says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. This is the difference between those who say they're Jews, but they're really not, because they're not a Jew inwardly. 
You say, you could call yourself a Jew all day long, but you're not really a Jew. And that's why someone like me can say, I'm a Jew. And God's going to recognize me as a Jew. Because it's not the outward flesh. You say, but you don't look like a Jew. I know, physically. I'm not saying I'm of any particular tribe. But inwardly, I have my heart is circumcised. Okay, and that's the circumcision that really matters. And I've taught an entire sermon on that as well. The circumcision of your heart, not made with hands. Being a child of promise, as Isaac was, so are we, so that we get the same inheritance and blessing that Abraham got being spiritual children of Abraham through his seed that was to come through Jesus Christ. Turn if you would to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And there's so much in Revelation 2 about the, you know, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. Well, what would be the blasphemy? When you blaspheme, the blasphemy is talking about blaspheming God. How greater blasphemy, how, more, how much more blasphemous can you get than saying that Jesus is not the Christ. Or saying that Jesus' works were of the devil. Well, he hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils cast he out devils. And who were those people that were saying that? Guess what? They also called themselves Jews. But were they of Abraham their father? No, they weren't. And we'll get to that in a little bit too. That's in John. But this is important to get this doctrine laid out of who is the Bible talking about. Obviously, people had to say that they were Jews, but they really weren't. This isn't the same. I mean, it's similar, I guess, but the people who would say that they're apostles and they weren't. Right? People are always claiming to be different things. What's the key about, about being a Jew is that you're one of God's people. But see, they're not really one of God's people because they're not saved. Because on the inside, on the heart, they're not believers. And notice, too, in Revelation 2.9, it says, they're, they say they're Jews or not, but they're the synagogue of Satan. And if that doesn't tip you off about who this group of people are that are calling themselves Jews and are not, I'll tell you what, it's not the disciples who say, no, it doesn't matter what the, what the outward flesh is, like Romans 2. It's not the Apostle Paul who's calling himself a Jew and isn't. It's not the Gentiles who are calling themselves Jew but are not because they're following Romans 2. It's the people who have a synagogue. And there's only one religion in the world that calls their, their sanctuary or the place of worship a synagogue. It's the Jews. It's the people who call themselves Jews. It's Judaism. But guess what? It's not the synagogue of God. It's the synagogue of Satan, of their father, the devil. It is a satanic religion. It truly is. Does that mean I want all Jews to go to hell physically? No, not, not any physical nation. We want to save the souls of the people. We want people to come to Christ. This isn't about, this isn't a racial thing. It's not like, like, we, like we have this, uh, you know, this anti you anti-Semite. You know, I'm sure people hearing us will say, well, you're just, you hate the Jews and you're an anti-Semite. You know what? I hate the religion of Judaism. And I hate the wicked reprobates like the ones that existed during Jesus' time that, that, that persecuted and killed our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the ones that conspired for his death. The devils that were doing the work of their father, the devil. Those are the ones I hate. But you know what? I love the ones like Apostle Paul that, that, can, that can realize the error of their way and, and change their belief and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. And those are the ones that we want to reach. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 26, the Bible reads, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Not, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And look at verse 29. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, what is it that determines being one of Abraham's seed, being a descendant of Abraham? It's not the physical birth. It's if you're Christ's. It's the spiritual birth that determines whether or not you are a Jew, whether you are the seed of Abraham. 
It has nothing to do with, with the physical. I mean, well, we're going to see that here in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4 explains this perfectly, the difference between the physical and the spiritual, between the law and the promise, between the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. You see this in, spelled out in Galatians chapter 4 and explained how the Old Testament gives us that allegory and tells us the truth about the whole situation and what's, what's right. Verse number 22, Galatians 4, the Bible reads, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. So this is true. We know it's Isaac and Ishmael, right? Ishmael was the son that was born of the bondmaid. It was a servant. It was this, this someone who was in bondage to Abraham and was serving him and was not free. She didn't have freedom. And there was a child that was born of that woman. And then there was a child that was born of Sarah, his wife, legitimate, that was, that was of the free woman. And he was born free, right? So these are the two people that are being illustrated here to teach a greater truth. Verse 23, but he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. The bond woman, that was Abraham's attempt to get this seed and to fulfill this promise of God by taking matters into his own hands. Him and his wife just deciding how they can make these things work and make it happen. And physically speaking, a child was born. But that's not the child that God promised. That is not what God had promised unto Abraham. That wasn't the seed that, that God was, was promising to him and giving to him and giving the inheritance to and everything else. That wasn't it. That was just a work of flesh. But the one that was born of Sarah was the son of the child of promise. Verse number 24, which things are an allegory. So he's telling us right now that all this happened is an allegory to teach us something else. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. What, so what came from Mount Sinai? The Ten Commandments, the law, right? That's what came uh, from Sinai, and that genders to bondage. That, that makes us, ultimately, is what makes us sinners and brings us into bond, the bondage of the law because we can't keep the law because we're not perfect. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answer it to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So physically speaking, there's a physical Jerusalem. And there's a physical Mount Sinai and there's the physical Old Covenant and the physical law. And, and all of that happened, he says, that is represented by the bondwoman and her seed. But there's a Jerusalem which is above is free. And the Jerusalem which is from above, which is the Jerusalem that we should be focused on, that everybody should be focused on, not the Jerusalem on this earth, not the Jerusalem that physically exists in the, in the physical land of Israel today, but the Jerusalem which is above, that is the Jerusalem which is free, which is the mother of us all. Verse 27, for it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. This is to the church in Galatia. These are Gentiles that the Apostle Paul is writing to and saying we, can, you know, putting himself in uh, unity with these other people, brethren, right? Because in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek. He said, but we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. That's where, who we're groped in. This is how God looks at believers is, oh yeah, you're a child of promise, whereas these other people are the children of flesh and the children of the bondwoman, and they're under bondage, and they think that following the law is going to save them, and that their, their good works are going to save them, and they're sorely mistaken. They're in bondage till this day. He says, but you realize that God made a promise. You have faith in that promise. You have faith in the Lord, and that is why you are free and look to the Jerusalem which is above. And that's how we gain entrance to be one of God's people to be a Jew, a spiritual Jew, to have a home in Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, and, and be one of his children and be a child of promise. Verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. So you're saying those that are of the flesh, those that are following these works-based salvation, these Jews, these physical Jews, 
persecute the believers, persecute the people of their faith in Christ, persecute the righteous people, the children of God, those that are of the flesh, persecute them. And we see that, again, played out. Read the Bible. Read the book of Acts. Who is it that's stirring up the trouble and the trials and the tribulations against the believers? It's the Jews. It's the, 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 the seed of the bondwoman. And what's, what's interesting is that me saying that would infuriate physical Jews who are believing in Judaism because they look at Ishmael as like the Palestinians. That's how, in their minds, they're viewing them as be, oh, you're these children of the bondwoman, but we're children of God, whereas the Bible is saying, no, you're children of the bondwoman. Because it doesn't matter if physically that's where you came from, but spiritually that's exactly where you are. You are children of the bondwoman. And that would infuriate them to be called that, but it's the truth. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why they killed Jesus, because they were infuriated by the things that he said and the truths that he told. Because they weren't ready to accept the word of God, they rejected it. Verse 30, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. This is how God feels about it. Cast him out. Bondwoman has nothing to do with the free woman. This is also why we're not going to go and be all buddy, buddy. Like, oh man, you're a Jew and start getting this Jew worship and everything else. No. Cast him out. I don't have anything to do with the, with the bondwoman. My inheritance is of promise. I'm not going to worship the, the, the bondwoman's son, the bastard child. That's not that I'm going to be all fawning over. Verse 31, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Turn if you go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 2. 1 John 2, 18 says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now, there are many, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you, because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. This is where the blasphemy comes from of those that say they are Jews and are not. Because they deny that Jesus is the Christ, and he is, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. So these blasphemers that call themselves Jews, they don't have the Father and they don't have the Son. You know, people like to say, oh, well, they worship God the Father, they just don't believe in the Son. No, they don't, they don't worship either. They don't believe in either because it's still the same God. There's still one God. And if they're going to reject the Son, then by virtue, they're going to have to reject the Father also. And this is what the Bible clearly teaches is that you can't have one without the other. If you're going to believe in the Son, you're going to believe in the Father. And vice versa. If you're going to believe in the Father, you're going to believe in the Son. And you can throw the Holy Ghost into the mix as well. You're not going to have the belief or faith in one and not another. You can't. Because if you do, you don't even understand God. You don't even understand who the Father is if you don't understand and you're going to reject the Son. Which they didn't. They thought, they thought that the Father was... A racist basically they thought that the father cared about their genealogy and where they physically descended from and he didn't all throughout it so that's why even joining yourself to be one of the nation of Israel even under the old covenant 
people of other nations can join themselves to be of Israel and can convert and join themselves unto one of the tribes and gain inheritance and everything else just like the natural born Jews. They could do the same thing. It wasn't about their descendancy. It was about their faith. It was about their belief. John chapter 8, verse number 33. They answered him, and this is when Jesus, of course, is confronting these devils, these Jews that were devils, the physical Jews, but not spiritual Jews. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. I told you, they don't like it. We weren't in bondage. Jesus saying, you're of, you know, like, you're of the bondwoman. Like Paul said in Galatians 4. We weren't in bondage. What do you mean we're in bondage? We're Abraham's seed. We're royalty. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So he's basically saying, you're not perfect. You guys think you, you're resting in the law and you think you're perfect according to God's law and you know what? You're in bondage because you're sinners, because you've broken the law, because you're just a bunch of stinking hypocrites. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Verse 36, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. There's another verse, Brother Mark, would have been helpful with that, that woman today out soul winning, right? If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, this is a woman that just didn't want to accept that salvation is eternal, that it's forever, that like, you know, that you could still lose your salvation. Look, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. If Jesus Christ frees you by putting your faith in Him, you are free indeed. There is nothing else added to that. There's nothing else you need to do. He's made you free. I'm free indeed. Verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. So Jesus is acknowledging physically that they were born of Abraham, that they were descendant of Abraham. He says, but you're trying to kill me. And he's going to bring this up here in a little bit. Verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my father and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. I love this because he just got done saying that I know you're Abraham's seed, but now he's saying, look, if you were Abraham's seed, then you would do this. He's, he's basically saying they're not Abraham's seed. He's differentiating between being a physical seed of Abraham and being a spiritual child of Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I've heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham didn't go and kill the messengers and kill the, the prophets and kill the people that came from God. He wanted to know the truth. But you guys are trying to kill me. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not of fornication, but my born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. These are the people who call themselves Jews and are not. Jesus said they're not children of Abraham. He says, I know physically you are, but you're not. And the reason why they're even calling themselves Jews is because physically they're descended from Abraham. So they think they're Jews, but they're not. He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, but he's a Jew, which is one inwardly. This is taught consistently throughout Scripture. Yes, I believe in replacement theology. Yes, I believe that the Jews had been chosen to be a people who were supposed to serve God. And ultimately, by and large, when Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not. So God gave the, the kingdom over to those who are going to do the works thereof. Because spiritually speaking, for a while, you know what? The Jews were the children of God. And, they were, and there were people that rose up and there were people who were who were actively serving the Lord and doing what was right and had their faith right in the Lord and they were children of God. But it got apostasy had just crept in so much and just and, and they'd gotten so far removed 
that when the truth finally came, when Jesus came, they rejected him. And then finally, God said, done. We're done with you now. Done. And in the New Testament now, there's these warnings and these people are coming up and saying, you know what, they say they're Jews and they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. Jesus called them out for him. He said, you're of your father, the devil. And they were the same people calling themselves Jews that Revelation chapter 2 is talking about. They say they're Jews, they're not. They're the synagogue of Satan. And these people still exist today. Look at the doctrine. Look at what was taught by the Pharisees. These people who love to walk around in long garments. They love the greetings of men. They talked hyper-spiritual. They, they, they wanted to look the part, but they were wicked as hell. You know who we see fits this bill more than anybody? The Catholic Church. The Roman Catholics and their priests. And they love to have their long garments and people calling them Father, Father. When the Bible says, let no man call you Father on earth because you have one Father in heaven. Just like the Jews have the, you know, the synagogues with their, with their rabbis. You're not supposed to be calling anyone rabbi. There's one rabbi. There's one master. That's Jesus. This spirit of antichrist, this children of bondage, is not limited to just one physical group of people. It's a religion. It's the religion of Judaism. But today we see it even in the religion of Catholicism. You know why? Because they're both based on works. They're both children of bondage. And they've rejected the way, the truth, and the life. One claims to believe it, and the other one doesn't at all. But just like the Jews in Jesus' day, they claim to believe in the Lord, they claim to believe in Moses, they claim to believe that stuff, but they didn't really. Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. They say, we believe Moses, but who are you? You know, like, you don't believe Moses. Moses spake of me. You didn't believe him. Last point, uh, turn to James 1. You know, no, I'm sorry, turn to 1 Peter 1. They're real close. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. So Smyrna, great church, but not the, the, not the message they were probably looking for, right? But they had, nothing, they had nothing bad to say about them. I know that works, tribulation, poverty. He knows the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but they're synagogue of Satan, and which again, I believe, is the, is the source, the primary source of their tribulation, and probably their poverty too is you've got these wicked Jews that say they're Jews, but they're just the synagogue of Satan. And then he admonishes them, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear not what man can do unto you. Right? We're supposed to fear God, not man. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So God's going to reward them for their work and saying, you know what? This is going to happen. You're going to be thrown into jail. You're going to be persecuted 10 days, but be faithful even unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. James 1, 12 says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now the crown of life don't let that bother you that it, that it says the word life in there because this isn't saying, this isn't like eternal life. You're, they're not winning eternal life by loving the Lord and making sure they go through everything and enduring to the end and everything else. This is a crown that they're earning. This is something added. This is something extra that they receive as a reward at the judgment seat of Christ. There are people that are going to endure trials and temptations and that they're going to cut get, when they're tried come through and while yes they may suffer and yes they may suffer unto death at the judgment seat of christ they're going to receive this crown of life there's multiple crowns that I, you know the bible talks about different crowns that you can receive and different rewards that you can receive one of them is the crown of life and the way that you get that is by being faithful all the way unto death and not backing out and not everything else this isn't talking about your eternal life. Crown of life is different. 
So I don't want to get too far into that tonight. There's not a whole lot of information about that, but it's very clear because you know salvation is, is not of works. Very, I mean, we could, we could prove that up and down with thousands, you know, with thousands of scriptures probably and prove that. But when we see in like James 1.12, it says, When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You know, and when you love the Lord, you keep his commandments. And so, you know, it's going to be a more works-based thing. So that has to be referring to something other than just eternal life. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the warning he's giving to the church of Smyrna is they're going to go through tribulation. I know your poverty. I know things aren't going great for you right now. I know you're facing tribulation. I know you're going to be cast in the, into uh, jail. You're going to be cast into prison for 10 days. And the devil's behind that. And the devil's attacking you. And you've got these, these, this synagogue of Satan nearby that's attacking you. And you're going through this. But be faithful unto death. You're going to get a crown of life. Keep your eye on the prize. Like we said, they, they've been doing a great job to this point. We know that their poverty, they weren't serving mammon. They were serving the Lord. We, we already see that they're rich. And God is just saying, just hang in there. Keep doing a good job and go to the end. It's going to be worth it. When you go through the trials, this is what he says in 1 Peter 1, 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, even though now for a season, for a short time, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. I know it's not easy. You have this burden. You have this heaviness for this season, this short period of time in your life. You've got manifold. You have multiple temptations, multiple trials and persecutions, and nothing seems right. I know you're going through a hard time right now, but he says you can still greatly rejoice that the trial of your faith, it's much more precious than of gold. That, you know, no matter how much gold you can accumulate on this earth, he says this trial of your faith, when you come through it, is going to be way more precious than that. And think about that. How's that for a motivation? Think about having a bunch of gold on this earth and what satisfaction physically you may gain from that, right? Like, oh man, wouldn't it be great if I had a million dollars and I could do this and that and that and whatever, whatever things you could dream up to, of having that money of what, whatever good that might do you and, and however much fun you can have. That the rewards that you get, the eternal valued rewards that God gives you is way better than whatever you could have done here with physical gold on this earth. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, anything that you satisfy yourself with, with money and gold, is going to be vain and empty. It's not fulfilling. As opposed to whatever reward that God literally is going to have for you when you go through these trials and you're going through these temptations and you come through them and you don't faint and you don't waver and you can stay solid unto death, man, God's going to give you a great reward for that. And you'll be so glad and thankful that you didn't sell out, that you didn't go after the money, that, yeah, I was, po I was poor, I had poverty, but you know what? I don't care about that because this is so much way better than that struggle I faced for a short period of time when I was on the earth, you know, struggling in my flesh. Now I've got this great reward from the Lord. This is what we need to be reminded of as we go through these things. Because it's not easy. Because it's not easy. Because some people will fail, some people will fall out, some people will quit and give up, but we don't want to be those people. Being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Because you know what? The appearing of Jesus Christ, that's when you're going to have the judgment seat of Christ and God's going to give you the rewards. And there's that special blessing for those that are martyred for Christ, that those that endure to the end, there's, they get a special reward for that. And rightfully so. 
keep that in mind. There's, there, there's, there's always a good motivation and a good reason to stay strong in the faith and not to just buckle and give in. You know, again, the same lady we were talking to earlier, it's kind of like th these people who just cannot grasp the concept of Jesus Christ actually paying for everything. They just get hung up on this idea. So you can just go and sin and do it every, you know, and it's not, you know, like, we have lots of other motivating factors besides being worried about hell. The same way that my kids have lots of other motivating factors to do right and to do good other than just fear of like me throwing them in my oven, which they don't have that fear because I'm never going to do it because they're my children. We're motivated by plenty of other things than we're not worried about God sending us to hell. We've got lots of great motivations for doing what's right. One of them being the great rewards that God has promised those that can remain faithful unto the end. Let's try to be a church with the mindset of Smyrna. They clearly had the right mindset. We don't even know that much about them. There's only like three short verses about that church in Smyrna. But what great things. And then to not even have, I mean, wouldn't that be great for God to show up and give us like a report card? And, you know, you see like on a kid's report card, you see like the teacher writes notes, you know, oh, well, they've got a little area. They got to work on this. Or they got to work on that. Smyrna got the report card with none of this. Well, you need to work on this. You need to work on this. It was just, hey, here's what's going to come. In the next grade, the next level up, here's what you got to look out for. You're on the right path. You're doing great. Watch out for this. That's the report card that I want to get from the Lord is, hey, you guys are doing great. You're going to be headed for some trials and tribulations, but stay solid. Stay in it. Keep serving the Lord. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great um, admonitions and, and just truths that we can find in your word. God, I pray that you please strengthen our church, build our church, Lord, add the members to this church as you see fit, that we can be a, a fully functional body uh, doing the most to serve you. God, uh, thank you for, for all of just providing your word for us and, and preserving your word for us today so that we can have a uh, perfect word of God that we can understand and read and know. And Lord, just, just guide our church and, and help us all to do what's right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.